Ezekiel chapter 43, verses 1 to 12. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell upon my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. And so the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. Behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings, by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places, in their setting of their threshold by my thresholds, and their post by my post, and the wall between me and them. They have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in my name. Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me. And I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities. And let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof, and write it in their sight, that they may keep the whole form thereof, and all the ordinances thereof, and do them. This is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof, round about, shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Pray for my blessing. God, is now as we look to you, Lord, and what you have for us this morning, I pray what you'll bless it to each and every one here. I pray God that we may have open hearts to receive your word today. God, may you just uh, help us now and to understand your word and how to apply it, Father, to our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Does anyone seem a little cool? Does it seem a little bit cool? Abby, would you mind going to the front desk and say, could you warm it up for us maybe a couple degrees? Yes. Make sure you say maybe like two degrees at the most because yeah. otherwise it wouldn't get too warm. So here it's, it, it's interesting to note that if you look back at uh, what it says there in the early part of this chapter, verse number two, it says, Behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Haven't we read that somewhere else in the Bible? Haven't we? What was that? What does that remind you of? Hold your place there. Go to Revelation chapter 1. Remember how I mentioned on Thursday night? How the truths that we see in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul, you know, the put off, renewed, put on, matches with Ezekiel. And they didn't know each other, but yet they go hand in hand. It's interesting here that if you look in Revelation chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths of the golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now notice verse 15. And his feet likened to fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Could be the same person? <laughs> and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So there we have both of those things, right? The glory is coming off of him. Also his voice sounding like many waters, sounding like the Niagara Falls. Uh, yeah. 
And John the Apostle says, verse 17, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. What did it say about Ezekiel? I fell upon my face. That's good. They both responded in the same way. Saw the same thing, the same person, and responded the same way. It says, um, And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So here we have Christ in Ezekiel. Christ has always been, amen? amen? And so it's no surprise that he shows up in the Old Testament, is it? If he's always been. If he made the world, no problem with that. So here he is. And so what we see here, uh, you know, even though um, the Apostle John and Ezekiel are 600 years apart, they never met each other. And yet they see the same thing. God shows them the same vision. This connects the Old Testament with the New Testament. It validates the Bible. It gives it validation. Uh, tremendous, eh? These old prophets, they saw some awesome things, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. These visions. If you look back at chapter 40, notice verse 2. Ezekiel chapter 40. We're back in Ezekiel now. Ezekiel 40 verse 2 says, In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and set me upon a very high mountain. So they saw these visions, eh? I'm sure it seemed just as real as uh, what we're experiencing. Uh, but again, it was a vision. It's like they were there, but not there. I think more real, I think a vision would be more real than a dream. Yeah. You know, our dreams can seem real, but kind of foggy. Yes. And, and a lot of times when you're dreaming, you know it's a dream. Yeah. Because it's kind of weird, and you're like, yeah. no, this is just a dream. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no way that guy has three heads. No way, All right. no way man. This is a dream. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's just some topsy turvy things that happen yeah. in our dreams. You know, you know it's a dream, right? Yeah. Yeah. But a vision, I believe a vision, vision from God, yeah. it's like you're there. Mm -hmm. It's like right. it must have been so real mm -hmm. to the Apostle John and to Ezekiel to experience these things. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like you get to see for a moment what God sees. In the future of what it's going to really be like yeah. right because god can see the future right yeah. and that's what he was doing he was revealing the future to these old prophets and apostles amazing Incredible. now what we have here uh starting in chapter 40 and all the way up into chapter 43 where we just read is a description of the temple and this temple in context of scripture it fits in the kingdom age, or the during the millennial reign of Christ. Some would say it's just symbolic, or but I, I don't believe that. I believe this is actually literal. I think it's something that actually Ezekiel saw, and, and then one day it will be built. And we do know that Christ will come back, and he will reign and rule from Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, we see some passages here of scripture leading up to the description of the temple. If you go back to Ezekiel chapter 38, Ezekiel chapter 38, notice verse 23. And this gives us an idea of the time frame of this during the millennial reign. Notice what it says. Uh, Thus will I magnify myself, God speaking, and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. How will he do that? Well, he'll be reigning and ruling on the earth. Uh, notice in chapter 39, verse 27. Chapter 39, verse 27. When I have brought them again for the people and gathered them out of their enemies' lands and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God. There's that phrase, right, that we see so many times, right, in Ezekiel. Uh, which caused them, anybody remember how many times? 63, very good. 
which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them into their own land and have left none of them anymore there. And so, again, referring to speaking of that millennial reign. Okay, so this is the context we find this description now of the temple, of this, this new temple, this future, future temple. beginning in, uh, from chapter 40 on. Uh, this temple, I didn't take time to get into the dimensions. I do like to do that from time to time and get into the nitty gritty of how big everything is or what size and stuff. Um, I didn't take time to do that, but I'm telling you one thing. Uh, this temple and the, the whole complex of this new temple, the millennial reign, will be massive. It will dwarf Solomon's temple. It will just look like a, a very small thing in comparison. This will be massive. Um, if you look at the reeds there, uh, the reeds, six cubits, and uh, uh, hands uh, span. I mean, just you add all these numbers up, it's massive. So go back to chapter 43 and notice with me verse number seven, just to establish more of the time frame again. Ezekiel 43 verse 7 says, And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne. Now, now we know this is speaking of Christ, right? And so if he's ruling and reigning from a throne, well, that, that has to be the millennial reign. Right. And he says, And the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. So this is talking about his kingdom that he will establish and it will never be destroyed. It will never be defeated. It will last forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom nor by their carcasses of their kings in their high places. So I think it's pretty clear of the time frame it's talking about here. Now, then it talks about, as you, if you, you've read this already, I'm sure in your Bible reading, you look on further into the chapter, we won't read all these verses, but from verse 13 all the way down to the end of the chapter, verse 27, it speaks of an altar. Again, massive. Everything's massive. Everything's huge. Everything's much bigger, greater than it was uh, during Solomon's day or even during the, the rebuilt uh, temple. If you look at the dimensions. And the question that arises to me is, why would they be doing offerings again? Why would they be you know, slaying animals and doing sacrifices again unto the Lord. Because we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, and when He came, He fulfilled, you know, all prophecies concerning the Messiah to come and who would die for the sins of the world. So why would there be sacrifices again during the millennial reign? Wouldn't that be just a natural, normal question, right, that would come into your mind? Well, keep in mind that all those sacrifices that took place in the Old Testament, they were not a replacement for Christ or they were not sufficient to atone for sins. Okay. Right. They were just types. They were just pictures of Christ. Okay. And they pointed to Christ to come. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what these will do is they will point back to Christ. They will not replace Christ. They will not, they're not means of uh, atonement. They're just pictures and memorials of Christ. So just as the Old Testament sacrifices pointed to Christ to come, these will point back to Christ okay, as a memorial to Him. Kind of like what we do with the Lord's Supper. Christ isn't dying again. or you know, It's just a memorial. It's, it's a remembrance of. And that's what these will be in that day. Okay. Memorial or remembrance. Of our Lord. As Hebrews says, chapter 10, verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Right. Okay. That's taught you know, throughout the scriptures. We understand that. Right. Uh, never, it, never does the scriptures ever imply that. Uh, it's only through Christ, and that shall remain true forever. So just as true as this is before the cross, it remains true forever after the cross. Hebrews 10.10, 10, 
by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Okay, so um, also something else I would like to throw in that places this during the time of the millennial reign is the interesting prophecy concerning the eastern gate. We see that in uh, chapter 44, the next chapter, just the first three verses of that chapter. Here we have this prophecy. Uh, it's also referred to as the golden gate. Perhaps you've heard of it. Notice what it says, uh, chapter 44, verse 1. I find this all very interesting. <coughs> See, this is, not, this is not mystical or symbolic. It's actually talking about real places, right. real things, like an actual throne that Christ is going to be ruling from in Jerusalem, right. an actual gate that we can go over there today and we can see. It's right there. You know what I mean? You can touch it. You can feel it. Notice uh, chapter 44, verse 1. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore, it shall be shut. It is for the prince. The prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. This prophecy has three parts. Okay. This prophecy remained unfulfilled for about 600 years from the time that Ezekiel wrote these words. And then on one spring day, about AD 30, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, went through this gate, the eastern gate, riding on a donkey, remember? Remember that? When they cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Blessed be the king. They called him the king, right? Their king. He is the king of the Jews. And so the first part of the prophecy was fulfilled that day. We call it Palm Sunday now, right? Now the second part, seem so outrageous, unbelievable, and yet it happened just like all of God's prophecies do. In the 16th century, the Sultan Suleiman rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, including the Eastern Gate, or the Golden Gate. After he rebuilt the gate, he had it walled up, great large stones, and shut. It seemed incredible. Right? Why would you rebuild all the walls and the gates? And right after you rebuild that particular gate, the golden gate, you wall it up and shut it. And so, as crazy may seem, outrageous, the second prophecy or second part of the prophecy was fulfilled. Just like God said, why would you have a gate and not use it? A very important gate too, because it was the entrance way to the area which used to be Solomon's temple, or that courtyard, and which now, where the Dome of the Rock or in that vicinity uh, is located. So, and these were not Jews, okay? The Sultan and you know, these guys, they were Muslims, right? Yeah. Why would they care about prophecy and Ezekiel? They weren't trying to fulfill prophecy. They weren't Muslims, right? They weren't Christians, they weren't Jews. Why would they wall it up? Because God said it would be rolled. God said it would be shut. Whatever God says comes to pass. You can go over there today and it's still shut. And it will be shut until God's timing. When the prince comes. And so the third part of the prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. When the prince, the prince of peace, shall enter through this eastern gate again. So this is the context of the temple, which is described to us between chapters 40 and 43. Let me just read that, that passage there in Isaiah where it talks about the Prince of Peace. It's such a good, good passage and uh, a, a nice Christmas passage as well. Isaiah chapter 9 and uh, verse number 6. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What a way for God to come into the world. Not on a flying unicorn with a million angels behind him, like you might have done. But as a baby, a little helpless baby. <laughs> what an entrance. Anyway, shows a lot about God's character, doesn't it? It's not how I would have chosen to come into the world. Oh, I'd have lots of thunder and lightning and earthquakes and volcanoes. And I'd, I'd have done it all. I'd have, just, I'd have shaken you guys up. You'd have been shaking. Not God's way. Aren't you glad I'm not God? Front to us, I hear an amen on that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Here we have the Prince. Amen. He's going to come back one day. And he's going to go through that gate. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Uh, he's going to blow a hole through it. He's going to the stone's going to melt away, or they're just going to disappear, or whatever. I don't know. He's, he's going to go through the gate, though. Yeah. One day, the third part of that prophecy shall be fulfilled. As sure as you're born. And then verse 7 says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Christ makes reference to that here, back in Ezekiel, right? The place of my throne, the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. There shall be no end, Isaiah says. Upon the throne of David, there's that throne, and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Amen. God's prophecies always come to pass. They always have. Right. They always will. You can trust this book. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Isn't Amen. that great? Amen. <laughs> you can't always trust the government. Yep. Government changes. People change. Yeah. Policies change. Parties change over time. You know, I look in the states. Uh, the Democratic Party in the states become very socialistic and communistic in their way, of, their ideology, the way they think. They weren't always like that. The Democrats used to think more like the Republicans think today, you know. But even Republicans have changed over time. Our, you know, what we have, conservatives in the states have changed. They're not as conservative as they used to be. You know? So man changes, right? Can't trust man. You can trust God. You can trust His Word. Amen. That's right. I'm so glad for that today. So Ezekiel's temple has to do with the time frame of the third part of the Golden Gate prophecy, which places it during the millennial reign when Christ is ruling the world from Jerusalem. Does that make sense? Now, for a few moments, I would like for us to focus on the first part of Go back to uh, chapter 43. Just those first few verses, okay? Verses um, 2 down to verse 6. Notice again the last phrase of verse number 3. Where Ezekiel says, And I fell upon my face. I really do feel like this message today is a follow-up from Thursday night's message. It's like the messages here lately have just been connecting, you know. I think that's of God. Again, how until we come to the end of ourselves, God can't help us. You know, we've got to, all of us, come to the end of ourselves or stay at the end of ourselves in order for God to help us. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, remember, like the cast sheep, we do very little to make ourselves progress spiritually. It is... The great shepherd who does most if we fully submit to him. The question is, are we submitted? Here we see Ezekiel humbling himself before God on his face, showing submission to God. Is this how we treat God? That's good. It's a privilege from God to allow us to worship Him. Do you realize that? Yes. 
you're not doing God any favors. Don't think you're ever doing God a favor. That's good. When you sing to God, are you doing Him a favor? When you come to church, are you doing God a favor? When you give out a gospel track, you tell someone about the gospel and how to be saved, are you doing God a favor? Wow. When you tithe, are you doing God a favor? No, He's doing you a favor. Yeah, He's allowing you to do these things. Yeah. He's allowing you to worship Him. Yeah. He was allowing you to serve Him. You're not doing Him a favor. He's doing you a favor. Sometimes our thinking is wrong. Uh, yes. You know, it's a bit twisted up. Yeah. Maybe we've been around certain influences or people or yeah. churches or they think a little twisted. They think yeah. a little wrong. Yeah. You know, and we got to say, wait a second here. Right. My thinking is not biblical. Right. We must not think like Catholics and Protestants. Yeah. That's, right. That's how they look at things. Because they work their way to heaven. Or they believe in good works yeah. for salvation. And even though they call themselves Christians, we don't agree with that theology. No, yes. okay. That's right. And they encompass a large part of what is known as Christendom or Christianity in the world. Yeah. It doesn't make it right because it's not biblical. Right. We're Baptists, amen? Yeah. Bible believers. Amen. We're not better than anybody, but we're just no. Bible believers. Amen. Paul said in Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living dead thing. We yeah. die to ourselves, right? And yet we live through Christ. Holy, he says, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable. Right. Not doing God favors. Right. He's doing you a favor. He's given you the strength in your body to be able to be here today to worship Him, to praise Him, yes. and to hear His word. Yeah. He's done you the favor. You're not doing Him a favor. Right. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Just your reasonable service. Right. May we be willing to junk our thinking if it's wrong. If we're not thinking right, we need to junk it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care where it came from. If it doesn't right. match up with what God says in His Word, we need to junk it. That's good. We can't think we're going to get anywhere with God if we give Him any kind of attitude. Do you know what I mean by attitude? Yeah. Yeah. Like thinking we're doing God a favor. God, look what I've done for you today. I read my Bible, God. So, hey, pay up, God. Pay up. Because I'm such a good Christian. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe you nothing. Like expecting God to work with our stubborn, rebellious heart. Well, God, this is just all you have to work with. Sorry. But I'm not going to change. Go ahead. Work on me, God. Work on my heart. Come on, help me out here. Make me spiritual, God. Yeah. Do your thing, God. And even though we're stubborn and rebellious, you think God's going to work with that? Right, exactly. Not in a million zillion years. No. We must be willing to change. We must be willing to admit we're wrong in our thinking sometimes. Say, Pastor Todd, what kind of people does God help? People like Apostle John. People like Ezekiel. Got on their face for God. Humbled themselves. Submitted themselves to God. Fully. Completely. With all their heart. No more attitude. No more thinking I'm doing God a favor. Hmm. He's doing me the favor. Right. So many favors. So many blessings. So Amen. Many. All Amen. the time. Amen. Come from His hand. Straight from His hand. 
every breath I take. Are you at that place? Only then can God do anything with you. Saved or lost. Even after you're saved, we have to stay submitted. Otherwise, God can't work with us. That clay is just too hard, too stubborn. It's not flexible. It's not moldable. So the sermon today is entitled, What Happens When We Fall on Our Face? You notice a few things here. Let me show, uh, just share with you five things. Notice verse 4. Number one, And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. Number one, the glory of the Lord came. The glory comes your way when you give in your face before God. The people are the people of God or the saved are like the house or temple of God. We're described in the New Testament, right? Yes. As being a temple of the Holy Ghost. And when you get born again, the glory of God moves in. God moves in. You're changed, forever changed. Yes. But sometimes even as saved, we, we grieve. Yes. And so the glory isn't by what it should be in our life. I'm not saying you lost your salvation or lost the Spirit of God, but it's just not quite what it should be. You know what I mean. Right. So in His time, depending on our full submission, He moves upon us again or can move upon us again. Right. Right? That glory comes back. Can come back. Oh, how we need His glory to move upon us. The glory of the Lord came into the house. Is Jesus in the house? Is Jesus shining out of you His glory? That's good. Is there glory in the house? The glory of the Lord came, Ezekiel said. Oh, how we need that glory. Oh, how we need to be so sensitive that we do not grieve the Spirit of God in our life. We can lose some of that glory. We know we're still saved, but it's just not quite as sweet as it used to be. You know? God wants to restore you. He wants that glory to return, come back. But this can only happen when we fully submit. We must. It's the only way. Full submission. Fall on your face before God. Right. Also, we see there, number two, in verse number five, So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. Number two, the Spirit took me up. We talked about the power of God on Thursday night in our Bible study. These are all progressive, uh, each one in sequence. Here we begin to experience God's grace and power over this world. Do we just talk about it? Like I said on Thursday, do we just talk about these things? You know, having power of the world and power of the flesh and power of the devil and power of temptations and trials that we face. Is it just something we dream about or think about or pray about but don't really live right. each and every day? God wants us to experience His grace. God wants us to experience His power. We can. Right. Amen. The Spirit can take us up and bring us towards a place of closer relationship with Him and fulfilling of our service to Him. Notice, Ezekiel says, and brought me into the inner court from the utter court or the outer court to the inner court. In other words, closer to God Fulfilling His purpose. Right. It's His purpose that matters, not my purpose. Right. Amen. What does James say? Draw nigh to God. 
he will draw nigh to you. Who does he do that to? What does James say? Those that humble themselves and submit to him. And if you look over real quick there in James chapter 4, notice what it says in verse 10. Hold your place there in Ezekiel. But in James chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. What did Ezekiel say? The Spirit took me up. We need God to lift us up. <laughs> above this world, above my flesh, above the power of the devil, I'm no match for the devil. I'm no match for this world. I'm no match for my flesh. I can't handle it. I cannot be, Miss Jess, a good Christian in myself. I can't do it. I'm a weak little sheep without my Lord, without my Christ. Oh, I can put on a good act. We're all good at that. <laughs> we got no problem with that. But what are you in your mind? What are you in your soul? In the deepest, darkest corners of your soul, what are you? What do you think about? That's what you are. Yeah. Amen. Right. Oh, I need Christ. Amen. I need the Lord to lift me up. Yeah. We need the Spirit to lift us up. Yes. The glory to come back. And the Spirit of God to give us that lift. Do you need a lift? Yeah. You need, <laughs> you need a lift. God will give you a spiritual lift. Amen. He wants to do that. If you'll submit, if you'll lower yourself, if you get on your face before God, you must, amen. It's the only way. Remember, God does most. We do very little. Wasn't that good from Thursday night? Yes. It's the truth. Many times we think, I do most of it. God helps out once in a while when I really need Him. It's not true. God is supposed to do most. He wants to do most. We do little. We can only do little. We're just sheep. God helps us, amen? God works through us as we submit, as we lower ourselves, as we humble ourselves before Him. Get on our face before God, as Ezekiel did. It's then God says, okay, yes, finally, I can do something with you. I can lift you up. I can help you. I can empower you. Because now you're humble before me. Right. And I see that. That's good. And you can't play games with God. You can't pretend. No. No. There is no pretense no. with God. No. None. That's right. He sees right through you. Yeah. <laughs> we can play games with each other. We can, yeah. you know. We can fake and yeah. how are you doing today? Oh, I'm feeling fine. Meanwhile, you're feeling terrible and you're just having all kinds of problems, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. we're not as honest as we should be. Yes, exactly. But we can't do that with God. Yeah. We need His lift. Amen. We need His Spirit. And when we humble ourselves and we get on our face, we receive a lift from Him. And this builds, okay? Then we have the number three. Back there in Ezekiel, chapter 43, verse number 5. So the Spirit took me up, brought me to the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. The filling of the Spirit. That's good. Oh, how we need the filling. Again, everything in sequence, right? It's building, right? Getting closer to God. More glory, more power. Amen? It just gets better. As you submit... It just gets better. Oh, that's good. It's opposite the world's thinking. The world's all about be independent. I you know, know. right? Well, yep. Be fierce. You know, just you be the man and do your thing and you know. You're the best. Just yeah. think of you're the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. Right? That's, the, that's the world's way. Yes. 
God's like, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's opposite, opposite of the world. Yeah. So true. But when you truly do that, yeah. what did the Apostle Paul say? I'm the least. Right? Yeah. He said, I'm the least. He's the Apostle Paul. Yeah. The greatest missionary besides Christ ever right. walked the earth. Right. He says, no, I'm the least of all the apostles. No, Paul, I'm the least. I disagree. Yeah. I'm the least. Same. You know? But when we junk our thinking that's wrong, yeah. we're willing to change, willing to fully submit to God, realize we're that weak little sheep that needs the shepherd, that God doesn't mean for you to be independent. He doesn't want you to be independent. An independent sheep. Some right. kind of super sheep. No, He wants you to be dependent upon Him right. and His power and His strength. Him alone. Not in yourself at all. Right. Have no confidence in the flesh. No, right. What you think you are in that same context of that passage there. Paul talks about what he was as a Pharisee. He was rich. He was famous. He was powerful. Yeah. Right? right? Could have lived a good life had anything he wanted or, you know? Yeah. He said, no, I'll follow my Christ. Amen. Got it all but done. No, 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 I want Christ. Amen. I want to win Christ. That's good. Amen. I love it. It's all about him. No, the person that says, I'll be independent. I will do it. I can do it. Well, that's an attitude of a goat. Yeah. I'll climb that mountain. Yeah. I'm a goat. I can do it. <laughs> I don't need no shepherd. I can climb those cliffs. That's a goat talking. Yeah. Are you a goat? Maybe not, but we might have the attitude of a goat. Yeah. If we stray from the Lord. Yeah. Right. No, the sheep says, I need the great shepherd. That's right. I'm going to rely on him. Amen. He's my strength. He's my son. Not me and what I can do. And not how spiritual I think I can be. Yeah. Oh no. It's all about him. Amen. The great shepherd. Total dependence is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. You can quote me on that. Total dependence on God is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of wisdom. Goes against the world's way of thinking, but it's right because it's biblical. Yeah, right. it's God's way. Right. Total dependence upon Him. Amen. So good. Isn't this good stuff? Yes. It's the truth. It's the way to joy. It's the way to peace. The way of love. It's the way of assurance of your salvation. It's the way of confidence, as we'll see in the end. Here. Oh, Amen. I'm the worst. I'm the worst. Amen. I'm the least. I'm the least. Like the Apostle Paul. If you truly mean that, God can work with you. You're a sheep that he can flip over and help. God wants to flip you over. Sometimes you're like, look what I'm doing. <laughs> We're not doing anything. We're just... Flailing our legs around. <laughs> not our arms, but our legs. Yeah. Sheep don't have legs. Our arms. They have legs, but not arms. <laughs> Alright, notice number four. Two more things here. What happens when we fall on our face? Number one, the glory of the Lord comes back. The Spirit will take you up. The glory of the Lord will fill the house. And then number four, notice verse six. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. We'll hear him speaking. We'll hear him speaking to us. It just gets better and better. It just gets richer and richer. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, 
It's bubbling in my soul. There's singing and laughter since Jesus took control. Folks don't understand it. I can't keep it quiet. It's bubbling, 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 bubbling day and night. Oh. Amen? Oh. It just gets sweeter and sweeter as we submit, fully submit to God. And he continues to work in our heart. Then we can sing. Oh, what sweet fellowship and joy divine. Like in the garden, like it used to be. Remember? With Adam and Eve. It says, and they heard the voice of the Lord of God, the Lord God, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They heard the voice of the Lord God. Do you hear his voice? Does he commune with you yes. and you with him? Do you have that closeness, that sweetness? Right. Is it just bubbling, bubbling, bubbling right. inside of you, coming out of you, coming right. little bubbles coming out of your ears, uh -huh. little bubbles coming out your nose? The bubbles of joy, of being right. saved and walking with God and right. just excited about His love That's and good. just loving on Him and Him loving on you and, you know. Oh, how it must have been back in the garden, eh? When God would walk through the garden, they would hear His voice. It can be that sweet for us here and now. I know physically we're not in the garden. We're in Cornwall. And there's all these things that we are dealing with right now on this sin-cursed earth. But spiritually, we can be in the garden with God. And that closeness can be there. That sweetness can be there. That love flowing can be there. Right. Just like it was back then. Adam and Eve hid themselves, but what blessing comes when there's no reason to hide? No reason to shy away from God. No reason to just quickly read through your Bible reading for the day because don't want to take too much time because it might get a little convicting. Don't want to meditate too much on those words because, oh man, those are very convicting words. So I'm just going to just breeze through it. Are we right. just playing games with God? Right. Are we just being religious? Right. Do we think we're doing God a favor by reading our Bible each day? Good. Oh, he's doing you a favor to allow you to read his word Amen. and get some help. Yeah. How's our thinking? Is our thinking wrong? If it's wrong, we need to junk it. Yeah. Start thinking right, biblically, right. which has so much to do with submission to God. He does most. We do very little. Right. I'm the least. I'm the worst. He's the best. He's the best. Yeah. That's how God works. You know, we, shouldn't we want to jump the way the world thinks? Yeah. Yes. And think the way God wants us to think? Yes. Shouldn't we want to do that? After all, He is God, isn't He? Yeah. Yes. He wrote the Bible for us. And this world is going to pass away in the lust thereof one day. just going to pass away. All this stuff and the way they right. think and everything down here and the way they right. operate. That's right. It's going to pass away one day. That's right. All their philosophy and you know, I'm the best, and you be the man, and you know, just no, all that's just gonna fade away one day, right? Amen. Into nothing. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Amen. That's good. And then the last thing we have that goes along with the song me and Abby sang, gonna stand by me, gonna stand by me. We see there in verse. Uh, number six, back in Ezekiel 43. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man, who's the man? Christ. Christ. Amen. The Son of Man. The man stood by me. Amen. I'm so glad the Lord is going to stand by me, going to stand by us. Amen. And we can be assured of and know through every trial, every temptation, tribulation, or persecution or whatever we may face in our life we can be confident that the Lord is going to stand by us That's good. just as he did for Stephen remember when God stood up for Stephen yeah. the Lord said he's sat down on the right hand throne of God is that what he said so he's sitting. He's in a sitting position. Would that be a factual statement? 
sat down on the right hand throne of God. That's what it said, right? Stephen, when he saw the heavens open, when he saw God, when he saw Christ, he was standing. He stood up for Stephen. Amen. God will stand up for you just like he did for Stephen. He'll stand by us. Acts 7.55 says, But he, speaking of Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. God gave him a little vision here. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God's going to stand by us, amen? Amen. In these days. Don't fear these days. Don't fear the last days. They're exciting days. Right. Okay? The Lord's going to stand up for us. He's going to stand by us in these days. Don't worry. Just like God stood by Stephen right. in his darkest hour. These people hated him and wanted to kill him. You know, stoned him. <laughs> he died with glory in his soul. He died, uh, what was he saying there, forgive them, you know? Kind of like our Lord on the cross. Forgive them, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Stephen had the same heart. How can you have that kind of a heart? Right. Because God's living through you. He's doing most of it. You're doing very little. Right. Because you're fully submitted to God. Amen. You're on your face before God. Right. Yeah. Fully submitted. And so he can live through you and love people even when they're throwing large rocks at your head. You wonder, how, how, could, I, how could I do that if that was me? How, how could I not say, wait a second, I got my rights. I'm going to call the cops, you know, or... No, I wasn't Stephen. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. How could he say that? How could he do that? Because no doubt Stephen had been on his face before God. Right. He had submitted to God fully. That's good. So he was experiencing these things that we've read here out of Ezekiel. Right. The glory, the Spirit of God taking him up, filling him, right? Speaking with him. Standing by Him. God will do the same for you. That's good. We need this kind of confidence, amen, that Stephen yeah. had in these last days. We don't know what we're going to face around the corner. Right. Oh, how God can give us this confidence. And we can have it. All of this can be ours if we will fall upon our face before God. Come to the end of ourselves. That's the key, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Come to the end of yourself. That's how you get saved. Sometimes maybe we want to take our life back from God in a way. We need to stay at the end of ourselves. 